Hello, beautiful people. You're listening to Communal Table, part of Food and Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, Senior Editor at Food and Wine. My guest today is Seamus Mullen, and he is a chef, a cookbook author, and somebody you might have seen on your television an awful lot. Um, he's been an inspiration to me for a long time uh, because he's really open about the struggles that he has had with autoimmune disease and how he used food to reclaim his body and reclaim his life. Uh, In his books, Hero Food and Real Food Heals, he deeply explores the relationship between what we put into our mouths and how our bodies feel. And he does it in such a tremendously positive and inspiring way. I just had to sit down and talk with him for a while. Come join us. Hello, beautiful people. You're listening to the Communal Table podcast, part of Food and Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, and my guest today is Seamus Mullen, a chef and author of Hero Food and Real Food Heals. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Thanks for having me. So if you're watching this, you can see the necklace (laughs) I have on. And if not, I'm going to tell you I'm wearing a phoenix. And I wore this for a very particular reason (laughs) because of of my guest who has a really pretty, pretty incredible story of how he used food to heal himself in all different kinds of ways. So can you give people a little bit of backstory of of where you were maybe 10 years ago or whatever the timing is? Sure. Where you want to start the Seamus story. Yeah, (laughs) where to to jump in. The Phoenix. Man, I love the Phoenix. I I think that... um, (laughs) Now, I, my Gaelic is non-existent, but I think the, <laughs> if I'm correct, and my pronunciation for Gaelic speakers out there, I apologize. I think it's uh, Fagarla, meaning out of the ashes rises the phoenix. And uh, so, I mean, in, in, in many ways, I definitely, I love that whole story of transformation and metamorphosis. Um, I was a really sick guy um, 10 years ago. And I had been sick for a number of years. I was a chef cooking in New York City, um, but I I was I was sick with an autoimmune dis- dysfunction. Uh, I was overweight. Um, I was on a ton of medication, and I was really at rock bottom. And and so in the um, in the in the metamorphosis story, I was in the ashes. Yeah, and you are not that now. <laughs> no, thank God. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. you are a you frequently on your Instagram post then and now pictures mm-hmm. and just of your 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 state of physical being, your state of emotional being. You uh can you talk about sorry to get this deep in there so <laughs> early in the podcast, but you are on the brink of death. Yeah, well, and I think I was on I was on the brink of death in in a number of ways. Yeah. Not only physical death, but um, I I was an angry guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- what are the rules around swearing? Oh, uh, go for it. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, well, just just in case one yeah. comes up, I you know got to be. Oh, uh, we had the voltagios sure. on. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. oh, that must have been a fuck lot of fun. <laughs> it was a fuck yeah. ton of fun. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So I I was I was really really sick, and I definitely the 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 lowest point for me was. Um, basically going through the classic near near death experience mm-hmm. where you see the tunnel of light and everything shuts down and uh and in in that moment i i was really i mean you know i'm amazed now as i learn more and more about we were just talking about transcendental meditation learn mm-hmm. more about the, the power of the mind and and how how much more autonomy we have over our thoughts and our mind than we may think we have um or, or over our body, you may think that we don't. We're only able to act. So we probably don't have autonomy over our thoughts, but we have. <laughs> we can work on yeah, it. We can work on that. <laughs> but, but that that we Lock really therapy. are. That are exactly that our <laughs> that our minds are our, our brains are really powerful in in ways that we don't even realize. And for for people who've gone through a near death experience, you kind of tap into a, a place of of consciousness that I think you don't even really realize exists. And uh, and that's that that. That decision point, that that um, that ability to exercise control over uh, all of the the um, uh, autonomic elements of your body, and realize, you know, I can choose to live or I can I can choose to die right now. It's not. It's actually my choice in this case, and um, and that was a real decision to, in, in my mind when I was going through that. That I realized, fuck this. I'm not going to leave this place now. I'm not ready to go. Mm-hmm. I have more work to do. 
and I made this very, uh, this very, I, I hate to say conscious, but conscious decision in a state of unconsciousness yeah. to come back to this place that we live in, this place called Earth or whatever it is, and this mm -hmm. life that whatever whatever it is that we're experiencing, and I realized that my work wasn't done. You had also we've um, we've we've gotten to speak to each other a few times about this. You had had some people who enabled you to get sick, some doctors who let you think it was the norm to have the back problems that you had. To yeah, you exactly. got you were kind of failed by medicine in some ways. Yeah, when I when I actually I uh, the 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 person who really helped me change my life and get onto a, a good path is uh, a doctor who practices functional medicine, Dr. Mm -hmm. Frank Lipman. And one of the things that he said to me when we first started working together is he said, it, it's a, and these are his words, it's a fucking crime what you've been through. Yeah. He said that, listen, you've, you know, you've gone, you've been, you have been um, abandoned by the, by the medical community, by this, mm -hmm. the medical community that we, that we throw people in. And I was, you know, I, I was, I, I was in suffering in chronic pain, but I'd had a number of issues. Like, as you said, I, I had spinal surgery and, and I, when I went to see, um, the first time I had a slip disc, the first time that my back started to give out, um, I, my spinal surgeon told me that it was normal for guys in their early 30s to experience a, a slip disc and that back surgery was not really a big deal. And to think that in hindsight, looking back, yeah. you know, if you look at babies, <laughs> we can learn Slippery a lot. little babies. <laughs> you look at babies like they, they lie on their back and they put their legs and their hands in the air and... That's actually if I and they can sit there for, for ages until you turn them over. As adults, it's extremely difficult for us to do that <laughs> to lie there with our legs in the air and and or, and if you right. resist to push against your knees, it's it's an incredible core workout. Mm -hmm. We are are because of the the world that we live in, um, and we sit in chairs all the time, and we wear shoes, and we don't spend a lot of time barefoot. We've kind of forgotten how to move innately. Like we're mm -hmm. we're constantly trying to get back mm -hmm. to what we knew intuitively as right. as as infants. And I think if I had you know if I had known then what I know now about functional movement and about mm -hmm. yoga, and um, I, I I could have completely avoided back surgery. It's I mean it's really the power of physical therapy mm -hmm. is such an intense thing. Um, I went through uh, intensely last year a pelvic floor physical therapy mm -hmm. where I didn't know that I owned hip flexors <laughs> before that. <laughs> but uh, once you sort of learn to deal with your hip flexors, yeah, it's yeah. such a thing. But um, being sick, so just for a backstory for, for me, and I'm still dealing with some of this endometriosis and mm -hmm. a gut con condition called SIBO and some other stuff. Uh, the that famous had, SIBO. Oh, SIBO, man. Uh, it's a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is it's it's really tough to kill mm -hmm. um but i hadn't ever been so in touch with with my body until i got sick and sort of hit some really pretty dark places along there and had to actually listen to it in my my mid 40s and there was a conversation that you and i had that actually really really changed things for me um Seamus has written a couple of books um the one that i'm thinking about in particular is called real food heals and it's a lot about being kind to your gut mm -hmm. and these foods that you can eat that are, are not foods of deprivation, that are foods that are living and breathing and, and, and beautiful. And you said a thing in, in this interview where you were saying, I eat as much as I want of these foods that I know are good for me. And that unlocked something for me because I had always thought before about eating in this mindful way meant, meant just portion control of mm -hmm. little things that are specifically designed for that. And it freed me to enjoy food in a way. And how did you get to that place with, with food where food did heal you? It, w it was a process. I mean, I was lucky in that professionally, my all of my experience was was coming from a place of learning how to make food taste really good. Yeah. Um, but the irony is that I didn't know very much about how food impacted my my health, my mm -hmm. well-being. And I got really used to feeling like shit all the time. Yeah. And when you're used to feeling like shit, um, I was actually having this conversation this morning with, with a, a friend of mine. We were talking about dairy. And, you know, the question is, <laughs> should I eat me. dairy or should I not yeah. eat dairy? And there's there's I don't think there's any um, – there's no hard and fast answer to that. It really depends on on – on the individual, and I know for me, for instance, I don't. If I eat dairy, I don't have like some horrific response. Mm -hmm. So I don't really notice that if I eat dairy, I don't. It has a negative impact on me. Right. But what I notice is when I don't eat dairy, mm -hmm. I suddenly feel a lot better, and I feel right. very different. And I think that that's something that's very hard for us to 
to really reconcile because it's difficult often to understand that you might be going through life feeling uh, subpar and you could feel mm -hmm. a lot better and you could perform a lot better and you could think a lot better mm -hmm. and you could be a lot happier and less angry if your body actually you were caring for your body when you're when you're constantly making things tough on your body mm -hmm. and not in a good way. I mean, it's good to be tough on your body. It's good to have you stress. It's good to have healthy stress. But it's also really good to care for your body and not to create chronic, like, paper cuts. Right. And, <laughs> on your soul. Uh, on your soul, yeah. <laughs> and and um, Or on your tongue or on the webs between your fingers. Oh, my God. So, yeah, that, and that's kind of what, when, when you're not really... Um, when you're not aware of how foods are making you feel, yeah. it's very difficult to be to, to be aware of how foods make you feel when you're looking through you know life through a cloudy lens. But getting to a point, and for me, it was really about going through a classic elimination diet mm -hmm. and taking out all of the major offenders, and then seeing and getting and healing my gut and getting to a place of yeah. being uh, less just noisy and kind of calming things out a little bit. And then I could start to add things back in and, and take mm -hmm. notes. And, and I did something really stupidly simple, but it was very helpful for me is I, I took photographs of everything that I ate. God, that's smart. And it was just, it was easier than actually logging everything down and mm -hmm. writing it down. So if I, I mean, everything, even like a glass of water, I, you know, I'm drinking a glass of water, take a picture of that. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, I would spend just a couple of minutes writing a little journal entry about how I felt. Mm -hmm. And if I consistently felt crappy that I'd look back and look at the things that I'd eaten and see if there's a correlation. Yeah. And uh, and one of the things that, that became really clear to me is that when I was eating really oily food that had a lot of canola oil or mm -hmm. had processed oil, I felt terrible. Yeah. When I ate a lot of sugar, I felt good and then I felt terrible. And and I started to recognize all these places that sugar was hiding that I didn't I didn't think I was eating a lot of sugar, but mm -hmm. realized it's that I was. It's sneaky. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I realized is that if I wasn't sitting down and having a meal, mm -hmm. just actually a meal, yeah, I was eating much more than I thought I was eating at the end of the day. I was eating far more, much. I mean, I didn't. Th I was always kind of not hungry, but not not hungry. Yeah, and it was a. It's not a great state. And now what I what I do is I, I generally don't eat until the middle of the day. This works for me to not mm -hmm. eat until the middle of the day. And I'm quite hungry by the time I just ate a meal like half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago. That was the first thing I've eaten today. I went to the gym. I had a busy morning. Mm -hmm. I was uh, quite active, but I felt totally fine. By the time that I had my lunch at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 2.30 in the afternoon, I was very, very hungry. Mm -hmm. um, but I ate it slowly, and I didn't eat a huge lunch. And immediately after eating it, I was actually hungry again. I'm like, oh, I still want to eat more. <laughs> and then I gave it a minute and drank a glass of water, and then I was like, oh, I feel great now. Yeah. Listening to your body is such a hard thing to do. And you did one of the most masochistic possible things you could do to your body, which is be a chef. Oh, chefs, God. Yes. Nobody is worse to their bodies, I, I think, than than chefs because you, you have to taste everything. You're having little bites of things all day. They're, the, the hours are mm -hmm. awful. And... Um, if you don't mind talking about this, and if you don't want to talk about that, that's fine. We had had a previous uh, like panel discussion um, where you talked about being the angry chef and mm -hmm. like clearing the pass and yep. stuff. How much of that was driven by your body? Can you talk about that that kind of behavior and where that came from? Yeah, well, anger is um, anger is something that you see happen or, or, or appear a lot in in kitchens and professional kitchens. Um, and it's, I think it's driven by a number of things. It's driven by the high stress of the environment. It's also driven by there's kind of this expectation because of the, the um, culture that and the, the long history of the kitchen that's very militaristic yeah. um, and very kind of 19th century in many ways uh, that the only way to manage is through, is through fear um, and yelling and screaming are a big part of that. Uh, and then, of course, for me, add on top of it that I felt like shit all the time. Yeah. There was a there's a lot of you know there's a lot of anger and then you add substance abuse to that and that totally changes the way you, your your rational mind works. Um, so I you know I I was very angry for a long time. I kind of fell into this what I call victim role, um, and it's really uh, it's really tempting and syrupy sweet to be a victim because it takes the responsibility of your circumstances off of you. Oh, it, he's sick. Yeah, he's like that exactly. Kind of thing, yeah. Well, no, no, not so much that. It's more like, why me? I don't deserve yeah. this. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I don't deserve this. And then you get angry because you feel like you're just the victim, and, and yeah. it's not your fault. And uh, and of course, 
you know, illness is not an individual's fault, but illness is often a byproduct or the, the, the severity of illness is often a byproduct of, of decisions and mindset. So it's very hard to be, um, it's very hard to, to love yourself mm -hmm. and care for yourself when you're in a state of just being hard on yourself all the time and, and acting like, and also acting like a victim and angry. Yeah. I, I know some of this pretty well. I try, I try not to externalize it, put it on other people, but then again, I was managing people. Um, I was in a state where I was, I was feeling so sick and in pain from endo and SIBO that I, I was in a physical therapy session and I referred to my body as a piece of garbage. My physical therapist started crying a little and mm. she had tears in her eyes and she said, please don't ever say that about yourself. Don't think of, of your body as that this is your body trying to heal you. Yeah. And it, it struck me because I could tell like, oh my God, this person loves my body for me more than I do at the moment. It was a really incredibly, mm -hmm. thank you, Stephanie Stamus, yeah. um, Beyond Basics Physical thank Therapy, you, um, who is an incredible uh, human being. And and that was hard too, because I realized I, I during that time, I wasn't being the friend I could be. I wasn't being the wife I, mm -hmm. I could be and stuff, because I was just feeling you know, mad at my body that whole yeah. time. It's a hard thing to get past. And especially if you are, well, if you're in a situation like a chef and you have seen this ma this behavior modeled for you. If you have seen people act out physically in the kitchen, um, and you're just going to repeat it because that's a valid way to do it. How do you switch out of that to the people around you? If you're still working with the same people, do you come in one day all of a sudden? Hey, I, I'm still shameless and I'm nice now, or I'm. Yeah. How do you how do you how do you make that pivot? Uh, you know, it's it, I don't. God, that's a very good question. It's really hard. I mean, there's there going from a state of self-loathing which yeah. is very difficult very and, real <laughs> yeah and it's real i mean i you know i i for many years i hated the meat vessel i was living in yep and and, and i understand that and hated the way my clothes felt on me mm -hmm. um, i hated looking at myself in the mirror and mm -hmm. what i saw like and that's not uncommon i think lots of people go through that mm -hmm. you know body dysmorphia and all of that and to me, it was really driven by this state of constant inflammation and feeling like shit. Yeah, and when you, <laughs> and when you feel like shit all the time, um, it's very difficult to love yourself and love your body because you're mm -hmm. because this is this thing that's making you feel like crap. When I was able to start to make positive changes in mm -hmm. in my life, um, physically, that led to positive emotional changes and behavioral changes. Um, I I lost. Slow. The better I felt, the less I had interest in doing, in 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 behaving in ways that were damaging to myself mm -hmm. physically. Um, substance abuse, for instance, yeah. those are things that that I knew were were damaging, and I didn't I didn't want to I didn't want to beat up what the progress I was making. And then as I started to feel better, and as I started to get like these glimmers of hope that I could actually change the direction of my of of my health. Um, I, I had a sense of, of gratitude mm -hmm. um, and gratitude for the opportunity to, to live a life that wasn't in pain again. Yeah. Uh, and that really shifted the way that I thought about, you know, it's the people around me. Um, and, I, you know, New York is hard. New York is a fucking pressure cooker. And, oh, you God, yeah. you know, you get on a bicycle and you try to ride through traffic or you get in a car and it's everyone is angry all the time. And... Um, uh, I know, I know um, that, that Louis C.K., although you know he's a bit of a fallen angel, mm. but uh, he had an incredible uh, piece that he did once about um, he had this like stand-up skit where he talked about driving the car when we should be the most compassionate and we're actually <laughs> complete assholes. Like imagine, oh you know, getting into the elevator with somebody and you know, telling them that you wanted to kill them and <laughs> whatever because they just bumped into you. Right. Uh, there's this no in New York. There's just so much, and it's not just New York. It's the world that we live in because we live in a world where it's everybody's doing a thousand things at once, yeah. and it's very difficult to put everything in your life on pause and just have a conversation. But I found that like if I could try to be a bit more present in whatever moment that I was in, and put away the extraneous things. So if I was having a conversation with someone, put my phone down and try to have the conversation as best I could. Um, that. It was a little bit easier for me to shed some of that anger, and yeah. it, it's a process. And I, I mean, I, I still deal with it on a daily basis. I'm yeah. still, I'm still an angry asshole sometimes. <laughs> I think it, 
there's a lot in recognizing that and being and accepting it and, and seeing it too. It, it makes me nuts to, uh, you know, I see some people who, you know, have now adopted this sort of mantle of like, look, I, I do the yoga now and yeah. do all this stuff now. I'm like, but y- it's still okay to have feelings. Yeah. Like I, you know, therapists have always said like feelings aren't good or bad. They are just there. They are and they acknowledge are. Yeah. them and they can kind of uh, flow through you. And it's like communicating that to s- so, you know, on to s- you have that you have that choice a million times a day if you mm-hmm. can what you're transmuting to somebody else, and again, like that that kitchen structure really <laughs> exacerbates that too. And I have seen more and more chefs take a different route, and you know, sort of qu- sometimes publicly, sometimes quietly get sober, or you know, stop taking that that easy sort of you know end of end of shift drink or going out with their staff after mm-hmm. work or something, and decide to do that and having. Maybe a lot of nervousness around that at the start because, like, what if they think I'm, you know, a, you know not a fun guy right. anymore? Um, but then they see the effect as having it on their teams. Let, can we talk about like modeling that better behavior for people who who work with you? Yeah, well, I think that one of the great things about about positive behavior and self love is that it it is contagious. Yeah. Um, so and th- and there's I a difference. I quote you on that all the time, by the way. I, you, you have no idea how often I quote you on oh, things. Oh, good. Yeah. But that is that is definitely one of those things. Yeah, <laughs> it's like conta- there, There's positive contagion. I think yeah. that that's. I think that's a good thing to remember because if you, if you see somebody, we, maybe we call it inspiration, but yeah. I I like to think of it as as being more than just looking at someone and being like, oh, <laughs> I'm so inspired by what the, what this person has done or or does, but rather I like to think of it as as um, you know. I want some of that to rub off on me. Mm-hmm. I want to catch that. And mm-hmm. uh, and that accountability, too, of, of being around, creating community. I mean, I, I, you know, the journey that I went through is not a remarkable journey. As much as it may seem like it was, I, I was able to, with the help of so many people, mm-hmm. reverse an incurable autoimmune disease yeah. and, and get off of tons of medication and get back to a place of really being comfortable in my body. But I did that with a lot of help and uh, a lot of determination on my behalf, but it's not unusual. A lot of people, there are so many people that are suffering unnecessarily yeah. that can do that. Um, so, you know, recruiting, recruiting the, 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 the team around you, recruiting your community to, to um, and, and encouraging them to, rather than have a cigarette break, have like, uh, you know, have a, have a conversation break, have a meditation break, mm-hmm. um, have a walk around the block break, you know, the, those things I think are really important to try to, and, 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 and the kitchen is obviously is a hier- hierarchical structure, mm-hmm. but if you can look at your team and, uh, and, and just, to me, it's super important just to check in with everyone see oh. how they're doing and just have a, have like a, a, a an emotional check-in that goes a long way. Oh, huge. And, um, and you know, it's not to say that you're going to give up on doing the, the after shift drink or, you know, going out to dinners all the time and everything, but it's, if, if you can, if you can start to change the, the patterns to where the majority of the patterns that you're following right. are, are positive patterns, I think right. that's a really good start. And I, I think there's a big shift in the chef community. You know, we, uh, you know, we go to the same conferences and things. I remember the first time I really sat down and talked with you, we were at South Beach mm-hmm. and I was just starting to really realize there was something wrong with mm-hmm. my, my body. Um, I right remember then. you were in a lot of pain. I was in so much pain right then. That was before I, I got a diagnosis and I was, I was white knuckling it through that time. Um, I was at a couple of points like curled up in my hotel room cause I, <sighs> I didn't understand what was, what was happening while I was in, in so much pain. I remember seeing you during that and I think maybe you saw something that I needed to, to talk about mm-hmm. cause you were, you were talking about, um, cycling and things, but I, there was a moment that um, I run across a lot with with chefs and mm-hmm. or with just people who are, are struggling with stuff. When you see somebody who's going through those things, um, I get asked by a lot of, of of people who don't know how to go to the people in their in their kitchen or in their lives and say like, "Hey, there's something going on here. Um, can you talk to me about it? Like, how to open that conversation? How did anybody open that conversation with you, or did you, or how do you open that with people you can see are struggling?" It's hard. It is. I mean, it's empathy. Yeah. You know, um, it, it's genuine kindness and concern. Um, y- it's something that you also have to understand and be very aware of the fact that there's only so much that you can do. Yeah. You know, we, we've, yeah. we've both lost friends to 
to suicide, and I'm that's sure a have. that's a that's you know that's a real a real tough place because you you always question is there anything else I could have done, and of course you you yeah. can't. You have to forgive yourself and understand that there's nothing you're, you're not. Yeah. It's not your fault. Um, there's nothing you could have done, but you you. I, I think what's really important is to to try to meet meet whether it's somebody that's going through a physical challenge, um, or or an emotional challenge, and oftentimes the two are completely intertwined. And mm -hmm. we, we we don't like, like we think of this is where health starts, like with the, chin, <laughs> the chin down, oh. and we you know and it, <laughs> and we don't and we separate all of this. But um, there's there's not only is there a physiological correlation. Yeah. Um, uh, the gut biome and 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 yep. and, and uh, mental health is and neurological inflammation is completely intertwined. Absolutely. Um, but meeting people and understanding if you see you know somebody you're concerned with and you see that they're not in a good place, just checking in with them and and just kind of like coming to their coming to where they are, meeting with them where they are, and just listening. I mean, I think that's the most important thing you can do. And ultimately, what that person decides to do with your with your support and and the ear that you lend them, you can't really, you can't control that. Yeah, there's only so much you can do. The, and yeah, and you have to forgive yourself for whatever it goes. I mean, the, where I've come to it on this is um, as I was going through a lot of the physical stuff, I took um, training for Crisis Text Line. So you go through thirty some mm -hmm. hours of, of training, and I just want to shout this out for anybody who can write it down for themselves or for some or anybody who needs it it's 24 7 and it, you just text 741741 and um, 24 7 somebody will be there at the other end of the line mm -hmm. to listen and what they say is they get people from a hot moment to a cool calm mm -hmm. and also it's 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 great on a whole lot of levels because you don't have to i hate the phone myself personally talking on the phone but um you can have a quiet conversation it's for people who are going through something where they it's a danger for them to be overheard, say mm -hmm. if they're in a domestic situation or at work or something, you can just text in there. Um, but the training that they gave us was for somebody who you're really worried is potentially going to harm themselves, like the escalation of questions and having that very direct uh, ask sometimes because mm -hmm. it's better than the alternative sometimes, but not if you, know, you can't save everyone. And that's a really, really hard lesson yeah. to learn and just being compassionate with yourself about what you can do and what you can't do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very it's very tough. It's yeah. really 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 tough. Yeah, and then also taking you take care of a lot of people. This is a thing that I see as an observer mm -hmm. of really because you you live your life. Um, Y'all should look at his Instagram <laughs> and uh, the things that, that that Seamus does, where he's riding three hundred miles <laughs> to help other people. Um, really talking openly about s the physical struggles about things and then and showing sort of where he was able to take his body then and where he, he can take it now. The thing that comes with that is when you're a very publicly sort of work in progress person, mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of people come to you. Mm -hmm. And how do you take care of yourself when you're taking care of the world? Well, I don't think I'm taking care of the world, but I, <laughs> you know, I, I certainly... You take care of more people than you know, honestly. <laughs> well, that's I'm glad to hear that because I think that that's that's really important to me. I, I very very strongly believe in 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 um, in karma and paying it forward. And it's not like I'm I'm trying to work out some karmic debt, but, <laughs> but I, oh, I, I am. yeah. <laughs> well, I don't. I I really you know for me I I derive a tremendous amount of of fulfillment and my ego is very fulfilled mm -hmm. when I, I hear that I've been able to help someone else. Yeah turn their life around honestly and that's huge i mean that's really it means it means a lot to me it means much more to me than if i that's to me that's a greater sense of purpose in 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 life you know it's not a, it's not about earning a, uh, a certain amount of money or having x possession or whatever it might be but but if there's an ability to help other people because i mean i i till i'm blue in the face i will praise dr frank Littman who helped mm -hmm. me um not because he gave me some miracle pill or he fixed me, but he taught me that I could take care of myself. Yeah. Um, and he was a, he is still, he's a very good friend and is a teacher to me. Um, and I, I'd like to think that I'm able to then play that role in, in yeah. some other people's lives. And with some people it's to a greater degree and with mm -hmm. others it's, it's to a lesser degree. Um, but it's, it's something that I, I've also been very fortunate that in this world that now is a there. I'm in this kind of great community of caring people that are all about taking care of other people yeah. and taking care of themselves as well. That I've, I'm connected to a lot of people that that are very knowledgeable and 
uh, think outside of the box and don't take the conventional route immediately to pick the lowest hanging fruit, but yeah. are, are are very intelligent about how they think about treating illness. And um, and I, I'm you know I, I love to be able to connect other people. So, yeah. so if a friend comes to me and says, I, you know, I have a very good friend of mine, my closest friend, his wife has been um, has been going through some health issues. And they initially thought that she had, was having a heart attack, and, and then her, her arms are going numb, and all of this, and she was kind of shuttled from one specialist to another with zero, you know, a, her her heart's fine. Okay, well, send her to the neurologist. Yeah. Her brain is fine. Yeah. And she's got real, she's just dealing with real pain and, and real chronic uh, issues. And so I, I was able to spend some time with her and then think about who's the right person for her to talk to, mm-hmm. make some introductions, and... You know, she's now taking a very different approach to caring for herself and 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 making progress. And that's, you know, that's something that I, I'm fortunate to be plugged into a community of people that 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 are very smart and caring. Um, but there's also a point at which you kind of have to draw the line. Yeah, I can't respond to every. I try to as best I can, but I can't respond to every bazillion request that, that that's asking for. You know, what do I need to eat and what's what's my <laughs> diet? What should my diet be? And the reality is I can't answer that. I can't tell someone what they need to eat because you don't know their body. I don't know their body. They test their they, yeah, levels there. <laughs> exactly. And ultimately, even with um, working with a really good nutritionist or a or doctor of functional medicine, mm-hmm. it comes down to the individual. How do you feel? Like, how do you actually feel? And until somebody knows how to answer that question, how do how do you feel in the relationship that you have with food? Um, the it, it, they're, they're never going to really progress past being ill. It, and everybody's body is so, so different. And I realized with, with SIBO, like it looks a million different ways. Mm-hmm. Like my trigger foods are so different than anybody else's. Yeah. And um, a, a thing that I've had to really uh, contend with is forgiving myself for having bad days when I'm not mm-hmm. uh, feeling okay. Cause you get to a point where you think I have solved it. I've done all yeah. the things here I am. And then, you know, recently, like I've been feeling really cruddy again and I have mm-hmm. to figure out how to do that. And it's, it's emotionally very disappointing because I, f- I thought like, ah, oh, I thought that was in the past. I thought I tackled it. How do you, how do you do that? How do you um, respond in those moments when, you know, do you feel like you need to constantly put on an air of like, no, it's all great now? Or do you let yourself be a human? No, I definitely let myself be a human. I mean, I, you know, th- this past year has been a really stressful year for me. I've had a lot of a lot of really challenge, ser- serious challenges I've had to go through. And it's it's OK to sometimes feel like shit and yeah. just allow yourself to feel like shit. Um, I think it's important to remember. And this is something I, I'm constantly reminding mm-hmm. myself of is that life is a roller coaster oh yeah <laughs> and it's not and it's a roller coaster that keeps like going and going it doesn't get to some destination um we're not you don't arrive at healthiness you don't arrive at <laughs> i'm here <laughs> yeah i got here i packed my bags and i made it you get there and then the weather changes right you know you get to the beach and it's raining and then you gotta <laughs> do something else so there the the thing that I, I try to remind myself of, and I saw I saw this written somewhere. It probably was on Instagram because it, it had all these great little quotes. But yeah. it's a it's a good one, um, which is uh, that you've survived all the worst days of your life. Um, True. So the number of times that I have felt like, oh my fucking god, this is the <laughs> end of the world. Everything, yep. the world is collapsing on me. Then something miraculously happens. Six o'clock comes around and people stop sending emails, <laughs> <laughs> and it's Friday. And until Monday morning, you get back to being you know nor- life isn't so bad. And then Monday morning it all starts up again. <laughs> right. and, but there, there's there's a moment of like just kind of disconnecting and realizing that none of this is going to kill you. This shit isn't going to kill you. Yeah. And and to it's okay to feel terrible and feel overwhelmed. Um, the the real challenge. And my brother has been in my life really helpful in reminding me of this. Is that he's all, my brother's very practical. He's very pragmatic. He's all, he, if I had a dime for every time he said block and tackle, but he's always like, <laughs> you just got to block and tackle. What does okay. that mean? I don't even know what it means because <laughs> I'm not a sports person. No. Well, yeah, I didn't realize for a long time. Or is it that was, a sports? I think, yeah, it is a sports. A sports. Sounds um, very football Exactly, but his his whole his his whole approach is okay. If you've got a thousand things to do. Yeah. Just knock two things off the off the list, mm-hmm. and then look at those things that you've done, and pat yourself on the back because you've accomplished a lot. And maybe that's all you can do today. Because sometimes, even 
crossing off a couple of big ticket items from your from your to do list takes so much emotional just energy to yeah. do it. It leaves you completely devoid of any capacity to do anything else. Yeah, it's. I get overwhelmed by what they call buffet syndrome. Yeah. Like this, this, this. Oh, and oh then, what I do? Oh my gosh. The kind yeah. of thing, I, honestly, I know I probably have talked about that. this. I've never heard that buffet syndrome. Oh my syndrome. God, That's somebody. So great. Well, yeah. and especially like I got diagnosed with ADHD in this past uh-huh. year and start, went on medication for that. And uh-huh. it's really, really helped with, with some of, of that. With that buffet of, syndrome? Yeah, yeah, because I was like, I can focus on this task. And it's been a really, really great yeah. thing because I would end the day feeling like super crap because I did a little of a bunch of things but didn't get yeah. to completely cross off anything. Yeah. So that's that's really huge. Yeah, it's sort of like the. I also think of, um, like I, re- I like to remind myself of 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 the Japanese tradition of focusing on one task and doing it really well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> I'm learning. I, yeah, it's hard, but it but it there is something really remarkable about that idea of uh, doing one thing and doing it very well. And I, I I know that for me to get good work done in that environment really involves putting the phone down. Oh, God. Because the phone is this constant, like, dis- distractor. It's, like, constantly pulling <laughs> you away. Yeah. You know, the, and the iPhone, someone once pointed out to me that the iPhone, if you look in the back of the iPhone, the, the Apple logo is an apple with a bite taken out of it. Yeah. It's literally the original sin. <laughs> it's, tempta- it's temptation. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the image of temptation that mm-hmm. you're constantly being tempted to something else, which makes it really difficult to have a sense of accomplishment because you're 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 never really a thousand percent focused on yeah. the 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 task at hand there was one point uh, in the last like half year and i realized like, what are all the ways that um people are trying to get in touch with me and i came to email twitter dm instagram dm facebook dm signal whatsapp text and phone Postcard. Oh my god! <laughs> no I, postcards and letters. <laughs> uh, pro- fr- probably from my dentist or right, <laughs> something. Exactly. And I was like, "That's." And I was beating myself up that I wasn't able to sort of address all of those. And then I realized, well, no, that's just too many. Yeah. Things. Um, I was asking. I had um, Yasmin Khan on mm-hmm. on the podcast, and she was saying she deletes all her social apps at the beginning of the weekend and puts them back on her phone on Monday. And oh I thought, wow! Oh, like that's really smart. Oh, and Slack. I forgot about Slack. Which oh is, yeah. Um, I, that's, uh, I've heard of that. I actually really, really like it because it cuts down on email significantly. Uh-huh. Um, but what does what does a really good self care day look like for you? Oh yeah, well, so I I have a house in Dutchess County in oh, the woods. Yeah. God, that's uh, right. And it's really really beautiful, and it has there's no cell service. Oh, same. Yeah. My, I have a yeah. place upstate, and yeah, yeah no, no cell, cell service, <laughs> and. For all intents and purposes, there's no internet either. There's really crappy satellite internet that, that doesn't really work for anything. That's great. So it's a it's it's really I try to go there as often as I can. And, and um, what I love is that when I get there, I I put my phone down, mm-hmm. um, and I don't really have this fear of my phone not being fully charged or like where yeah. is my phone or it's got to be on me at all times. Um, so a, a really good day of self care for me is is cooking exercising, uh, maybe a little bit of reading, watching a movie, um, being in nature, being outside, going for a hike, going for a walk, going for a bike ride, um, tinkering, just cleaning, vacuuming. I love to vacuum. Really? Oh my God. I'm like, I'm yes. There are a few things that I enjoy more than the sound of dust going up a vacuum cleaner. That's such a chef thing. (laughs) I feel like. Yeah. I really love, I love that. Okay. So what's your favorite vacuum? Uh, well, I'm taking endorsements right now. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I love I love yeah, is. Spon- <laughs> Miele. I love Miele. I have I have two Miele vac- vacuum cleaners. That's nice design. Yeah, <laughs> really, we've got a, a Dyson pet hair vac. Oh yeah, those are great too. I had a Dyson for a while, but I found that it was just too complex. I like the simplicity of the Miele. Yeah, that. And are you a, a mopper, a sweeper? Or? No, I hate doing that. <laughs> I hate laundry. I hate making the bed. I mean, I make the bed, but I don't yeah. like to make the bed. Yeah. Um, I can't stand folding laundry. I don't mind doing laundry, but folding oh, laundry I can't I, stand. Okay, if you my, luckily my husband is a very neat person, uh-huh. and I actually put it in our wedding vows like, oh, about really? my various yeah. messinesses and stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, he's he's so great about like his own stuff, ironing and folding, and luckily he does like the household stuff, uh-huh. like the napkins, the you know all that stuff. But just heaps of my clothes everywhere. And uh, sorry about that, Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> You're a saint, Douglas. He's he really, <laughs> really, truly is. Um, I. Weirdly, painting is the task for me. We've been like painting a house, uh-huh. and that's been really like that repetitive task. It's, like, is therapeutic? You really oh, it's so good. I just painted a whole kitchen black, like chalkboard paint. Wow. And with glossy cabinets. Uh-huh. Oh, God. 
I, I had seen it in Rachel Ray's test kitchen ages uh-huh. ago, and it's the most calming, beautiful thing in the world. Oh, good to know. Yeah. So, so then, okay, on this ideal day of self-care, what are you cooking for yourself? Um, gosh, you know, it really depends on what time of year it is, but yeah. I, I do a lot of, um, uh, I love to grill and I love to oh, yeah. cook vegetables outside and cook things really slowly. Um, and braises and I mean, tons of vegetables. I, there, there's so many things that I, I, whenever, whenever I can cook outside, I love to cook outside. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm a fire person. Yeah, <laughs> me too. So I've, I've got, um, grills and things outside to cook with, uh, and I don't know. I just like to. I I love having meals with lots of people. You know, yeah. big 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 family family meals. Um, uh, and and uh, you. I mean, you won't find any bread, um, but you will find lots of fish and meat and veggies and lots of deliciousness. So, what is that meal that you have when you're like, okay, I need a reset. I am going to make. This like what is your 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 go to dish for just like my body needs to feel better my gut my my spirit my whatever like what is that what does that food look like what's it served in mm-hmm. and how do you eat it? Well, let's see. One of the things that I really have been into lately is um, making just these soups with braised bok choy and ginger and garlic and shiitake mushrooms and braised chicken and like a really clear chicken consomme. Mm-hmm. Um, just super, super clean and light and delicate and flavorful and just um, that to kind of start. And then uh, uh, maybe some roasted cauliflower. Um, you and cauliflower is a special yeah, thing. Yeah, let's, I love Let's I talk love about that with yeah. the gochujang. Let's talk about that yeah. dish. Because there, yeah. there was there was a roasted cauliflower in your book, I mm-hmm. believe. It, yeah, yeah. Tell, tell the people what this the one is. The, the one in my book is a really simple roasted cauliflower dish. It's made with coconut oil. Um Lime juice, uh, cilantro, sea salt, and maybe like some, maybe some pepper of some sort, like mm-hmm. maybe a little bit of something or Aleppo pepper or something for a spice. But it's super simple. But that's like I, you know I love roasting cauliflower um, or braising cauliflower yeah. or steaming cauliflower. I mean it's it's good stuff. I'm a big fan of cauliflower. Yeah. So um, oh, you know what I've been doing oh, actually? I've been taking whole heads of cauliflower and putting it in the smoker oh. and just smoking it for like three hours. I think to me, one of the most relaxing contemplative things, like we talked some about meditation, my most meditative thing is taking care of a smoker. Mm -hmm. Just that, you know, and I have a really, really plain barrel smoker Mm -hmm. that I switch out the coals on and and the woods and Mm -hmm. things. And that that moment of that ritual of like mopping the the meat, the Mm -hmm. vegetables or whatever in there, that whole ritual, I just think is probably when I'm at my calmest. Yeah. There's something really nice about just observing food as it changes. And when you're doing a slow cooked piece of, of meat or something like mm-hmm. that, you really have to pay attention to it. But you're watching this process. You're slowly watching it transform. Yeah. And it's there's something very meditative about it. And then you get to feed people at the end of it. Oh, which yeah. Is a and, that's all, and people are always, I mean, it's always tastes so good when you're cooking something slowly like that. What is the meal that you make for a friend with a broken heart? Ooh, I mean, it's kind of... Uh, it, it's a little bit of a of a cliche, but roast chicken. It's just like There's so comforting, there. you know. Comforting roast roast chicken, braised mushrooms mm-hmm. with chicken jus, and then just kind of like carve the chicken and and spoon the mushrooms and jus over the chicken with some fresh herbs. Super simple. Yeah. How about for a friend with a cold? Um, for a friend with a cold, probably back to that soup that I was talking about before, because yeah. that's really that that Can one's. Can you just break it down? Sure. So, um, start with a really good chicken stock. Um, mm-hmm. Clarify it if you're really totally nuts. <laughs> Can you explain for people <coughs> what that means? Sure. When you clarify uh, a chicken stock or a br- any stock, um, you're 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 using uh, a raft. Usually, you use egg whites. So the protein mm-hmm. in the egg whites traps all of the impurities in the um, in in the stock, which is usually like hemoglobin that comes from the bones of the chicken that mm-hmm. you've roasted, uh, and and other and oils that are in in fats that are in the stock, and then they all simmer up to the top of the the raft, which you make by beating egg, egg whites, um, and then you strain it off. You spoon it through uh, a hole in the raft, and you strain it off through through um, a cloth, cheesecloth, or through a coffee filter. It's a big process. Yeah. You can also just buy some really good chicken stock <laughs> if you want. Um, but yeah. chicken consomme, if there's there's something really beautiful about a chicken consomme, it's yeah. worth it's worth learning how to do it. And the first time you make a consomme, there's something amazingly rewarding about looking mm-hmm. at this this just beautifully sort of amber colored broth that has 
that's perfectly clear all the way through. Um, so let's assume that you've gone through the effort of made, making this amazing <laughs> yeah. consomme. And then you can, uh, I like to do poached chicken breast where I'll take the mm -hmm. breast and chicken breast and, and season it with salt and pepper. Um, and then what I might do is in the bottom of the, the pot, I will start by just sweating out um, a little bit of, uh, of olive oil with, with um, sliced garlic and shiitake mushrooms. And then I'll add in um, uh, deglaze with a little bit of fish sauce. And then I'll add in the, the consomme and the chicken chicken breast, and I'll just poach that until it's cooked through, gently cooked through. It'll probably take like 10 minutes simmering. Mm -hmm. And then add the um, the bok choy, and then when I serve it, just a, a julienne of ginger and um, and maybe a squeeze of lime, some cilantro or some fresh herbs with it, and that's it. But it's, it's really, really calming. It's just a very kind of like soul-satisfying soup. I mean, making chicken soup for somebody is such a, when I was telling a friend yesterday that I, I have a particular soup that I make for people, especially when they have chest colds, mm -hmm. and it's that um, silky chicken soup, mm -hmm. the black chick, this black skin yep. chicken soup with tons of goji yeah, berries yeah. in there and gull and gall and all that. That's stuff. a TCM favorite. Traditional Chinese medicine. Oh yeah, yeah. it works mm -hmm. too. Like for for me, when I've had especially chest colds and things, I was I was very sick at the, around this. I, I end up luckily knock on this table. No, I, seriously, that this uh, around this time last year, I was in Toronto and I'd been just having a chest cold that was dogging me. And luckily, I was staying in a hotel that had a sort of very fancy Hong Kong style restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I think I got a black chicken soup two days in a row oh, wow. there. And it and I had to be like on stage speaking mm -hmm. like. A during this thing and I, it, it really is what got me through in a big big way yeah it's amazing i mean chicken soup is soup in general yeah. is, is obviously it's one of the oldest the oldest uh, medicines uh but it's so good for the gut the yeah. all the collagen in in the broth um is really really good for healing the lining of the gut when it's damaged so it's a it's a great you know it's a win-win yeah and you've come back to ginger a few times during mm -hmm. this um what is it about ginger for you well, I think that um, in traditional Chinese medicine, ginger is heating. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's very calming. Uh, it's it's um, it just adds like a bright a bright flavor. I love to use ginger at the very end mm -hmm. of a dish, or I'll use I'll grate it on a microplane to make a little pulp of the ginger mm -hmm. and add it into um, add it into a vinaigrette. Uh, but I like to really get the vi the spiciness to it. But there's something to me that's very calming about it. Um, I don't know. I just I really have always loved ginger. It, you know what? If I'm really at my cruddiest, um, I actually had a uh, drink a couple weeks ago. I was meeting with a friend. Um, I was at the bar at the Modern mm -hmm. and asked them if they would make me uh, something that was super gingery. And it was ginger in two different uh, formats. They had done like a cold press and then had done a hot version of it, too, and then and cooled it down. And it was just ginger straight to the face mm -hmm. and the gut. And I walked out of there just feeling, woo. Yeah. <laughs> it was a truly beautiful thing. Yeah. And, um, I don't know if you've gone through this or, or, or not, but for me, this has been a really pervasive thing um, that because I have trigger foods and because mm -hmm. I've got issues and things, I found myself um, going through that process and going through elimination and being afraid of food, which is a thing that is very terrible for oh, somebody yeah. who writes about food for a living and for whom food has been the connector and the driver and the source of joy for you know, my entire life. I got to a point where I was so afraid to eat anything because I was afraid it would hurt me. Mm -hmm. It affected my social life. It affected, I didn't go to restaurants for a year or so. Yeah, you don't want to be the pain in the ass that's 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 yeah. always complaining, I can't have that, I can't have this. Yeah, I, I was so worried about that. I couldn't go out with friends in in the same uh, kind of way. Uh, you know, my poor husband, <laughs> again, Douglas the same. Um, you know, we had to completely reboot our diets at home. And basically, you know, I still mostly paleo mm -hmm. and really do that. But I was afraid to add new foods uh, to it. And I got s scared of food. And that's a really damaging thing. And coming back from that, I still have moments of that. Were you ever in a place where you were afraid of, of any foods? Or have you, um, or have you seen people go through I've that? I've seen people go through it. I mean, you know... Orthorexia is a real, it's real. It's, it's real. It's, it's, real. it's very real. Um, if I've, fortunately, I've, I've never, well, it's not true. I mean, I have, uh, without getting like too, too nuts and boltsy yeah. here, but like really spicy food fucks me up. Yeah. Like fucks me up in a way that I, the next day, just my stomach, my lower intestine really hurts. Mm -hmm. um, and the irony is that there's obviously, there's like a lot of machismo in eating hot oh, and spicy food. Yeah. And um, 
I've always, you know, always <laughs> prided myself on the ability to eat spicy food and like hot food. And, and I do, I actually, I mean, I love the flavors. Like yeah. one, uh, habanero pepper is one of my favorite flavors. Mm -hmm. I just, I love that bright fruitiness. I know how when I'm cooking for myself to mitigate it so you, you still get the pepper flavor yeah. and, and, and it's not overly spicy and, and I'm totally fine with it. But um, that combination of pepper or dried peppers and oil mm -hmm. to me is a killer. Oh, like Szechuan Szech food will it kills me. Like yeah. Dan Dan noodles is is a recipe for disaster for me. I'm going to yeah. be in pain for two days if I eat Dan Dan noodles. Yeah. I love them. I think they taste absolutely amazing. And it's it's a really hard, um, definitely like a hard moment to to recognize that there's things that you really love to eat that make you feel like shit. Yeah. And so then you end up being kind of scared of it. I was just in Bali not too long ago and I, I went to this amazing restaurant called Nusantara in, in Ubud. And it was, I mean, this is like phenomenal food. But I knew as I was eating it yep. that I was going to feel terrible the next day. And of course, I, I did. Like, I don't sleep very well. Um, spicy food totally interrupts my, my, my sleep. My hands start to hurt. I get, I get swollen joints. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have like a day, a full day of like pain in my gut. And uh, so it, it, it's hard when I travel and like eating food that I'm hungry and this tastes delicious and I really want it. And as I'm eating, I'm like, it's so good. I know this is going <laughs> to fuck me up. I shouldn't yeah. eat this, but it's so good. And then I do. And the next day I feel like crap again. You know, I, I actually was going to ask you about traveling. My nutritionist and I, like she's Victoria Albina. She is a tremendous healing, beautiful person who loves all bodies. Mm -hmm. And she taught me about harm reduction. Mm -hmm. If it's the difference between me being hungry and just sitting in my hotel room, like shaking and feeling sorry for myself, yeah. frankly, um, and eating the thing, eat the thing. And because I know it's not going to kill me. I'm going to feel terrible yeah. but to go ahead and eat that and maybe not eat all of it or eat around in, the, mm -hmm. in kind of the way um, that I can. But that, how do you take care of yourself when you travel? You travel so much. Yeah. Well, I mean, what you just said is really useful. Like be, be aware, be cognizant that it's, you're not going to feel great when you eat it mm -hmm. because then when you don't feel great, you know why that is. Yeah. And you can kind of, you can file that away in your memory bank and know that <laughs> next time maybe it'll be, a, you'll be a little bit more uh, prepared um, and might prep some food in <laughs> advance to take it with you on the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it is hard. I mean, it, it's, to the best of my ability, I try to, I try not to eat garbage. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's inevitable. I mean, I, when I was flying back from Bali, when I flew to Bali, I took some food with me. Yeah. But I was flying back and I didn't have the ability or the, I mean, I probably could have, if I really made a priority out of it, I, I pack some food, but I, I didn't. And, you know, you're on a, you're on airplanes for 25 hours and all you're getting is really terrible food. And I, I, I didn't feel great for a couple of days yeah. as a result of that. Um, so, you know, I try to as best I can when I'm w seek out in advance, if I'm going to, if I'm traveling someplace, try to do a little bit of research before I go to know where are the places that I can eat. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, and then what uh, on the road, I and mean, it really depends on where I'm going to, because yeah. if I'm going to like a, uh, to a great dining city like Charleston, South Carolina, oh, yeah. <laughs> or if I'm going to Los Angeles, or if I'm going to London, there's obviously going to be great options. Yeah. Um, not so often when you go to some of the other places in the world that aren't great options, and then you're kind of stuck and you kind of have to figure it out. And I think it's okay to just, if you live in this fear of food all the time, yeah. That's just as damaging as 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 eating, you know, the food that might cause you some discomfort. Um, I I often say sometimes the healthiest thing you can do is eat the slice of fucking pizza or have yeah. the donut. <laughs> yep. <laughs> because if you're gonna sit there and just worry about how, a like how this is gonna derail your your all your best intentions, or you're gonna be it's gonna make you feel really crappy, or then you're gonna feel terrible about yourself because you ate ice cream and you shouldn't you should have enough self control not to eat ice cream. Mm -hmm. Like those that's that's like far more damaging. I, I realize, I, you know, I definitely have gotten into phases like that and I'm just stealing joy from myself yeah. and I'm not going out and having the experience. I mean, I realize the, the sanest thing I can do for myself is to have that backup food. Like, you know, shout out to RX bars because mm -hmm. I know if nothing else, I can always have one of those. So I have them 
in the lining of all of my suitcases. <laughs> That's you, smart, yeah. Yeah, I usually have one in um, in my purse somewhere mm-hmm. because I, I know otherwise, you know, if it's if it's between, like, not eating, ha- you know, having that, like, mm-hmm. you know, it really kind of saved my sanity. I thought, if nothing else, you know, I can I can feed myself. And, yeah. you know, and they're, they're, they're pretty great. And, you know, they really saved me in a lot of hotel rooms in, yeah, in yeah. places. I remember the first trip to New Orleans after sort of, uh, af- after my nutritionist said, well, you know, I took the SIBO test. And yeah. they're like, wow you have a terrible terrible case of this oh god yeah and uh yeah that was that was not fun um but going to new orleans and with a bunch of friends we have a trip we go at easter every year and thinking how do i tackle this city that i love where all this stuff is around every corner and i realized okay i'm just i have to do it in a in a joyful way Mm -hmm. still so i'm like okay i'm going to have a friend 75 at the friend 75 bar Mm -hmm. because i would be so mad at myself if i didn't Mm -hmm. do that I realized I never feel bad when I eat oysters, so mm-hmm. <laughs> do but that. Great. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So maybe I'm not having an etouffee somewhere, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know, or, or having some of those other things where, like, God, I want that thing. The bread is rare in most places. It's rarely worth it. Is mm-hmm. what I've yeah. sort of realized. But then you go to like Blue Hill Stone Barns and like, yeah, that's bre- that bread is worth it. Yeah, and have it. Yeah, you know? and and if and, I mean, assuming you're not celiac, yeah. you know, have it and and uh, and if chances are. Yeah. If everything is like, if you're taking your, care of yourself in all other aspects, because mm-hmm. you're not going to have any, I mean, I know for me, like, <laughs> if I'm eating crappy bread all the time, I, I do not feel <laughs> good at all. But if I, yeah. every once in a while, have, uh, you know, have a, a great slice of bread that's made from ancient grains and naturally fermented with yeah. a slab of really good grass fed butter on it and some sea salt. <laughs> I know it's pretty damn good. I I mean I went to a friend's birthday party at Danielle recently, and I was not gonna miss that bread, mm-hmm. like, and I was not gonna miss that dessert and stuff. And mm-hmm. um, you know, and it was a really uh, should I have had all those mashed potatoes with cream in it? No, I should not have. Mm-hmm. But the the joy in the in the moment mm-hmm. outweighed that, you know. And then I just I reset for the rest of the week and just right. kind of like the the safe <laughs> foods for that. Yeah. So, but let's talk about um, starting a physical practice because you are somebody who is so publicly engaged in exercise mm-hmm. what do you say to the person say it's a you know it's a chef it's because th- this is airing on food and wine pro mm-hmm. <laughs> which yep. uh, will you know have lunch by this time and so we're really taking care of people in in the trade um so somebody who is maybe a person who's worked on the line and and they're you know you can still catch them mm-hmm. they're still in their 20s yeah. you can still catch them and but they've you know been living this life where they just treat their bodies like crap and stuff and they've never thought of themselves as a yoga person as a bike person or whatever mm-hmm. how do you how do you take that first step off the off the couch yeah it's hard um, because the beginning oftentimes if you've never really exercised before mm-hmm. or you haven't had a practice of exercise for a while you the first few times you don't feel great you know you're very <laughs> sore you're really tight and then you're self-conscious you have, yeah maybe? <laughs> exactly you're self-conscious like if you're a big dude like me and you're showing up in yoga pants <laughs> all right maybe i'm not showing up in yoga <laughs> pants but um you know th- there's definitely uh you're, you're gonna you're gonna feel a little bit crappy at first yeah but you got to stick with it and then get over the hump and then uh, you know one of the great things about and i've seen this with so many people exercise is addictive mm-hmm. it's an addiction and there are good addictions. Yeah. It's a healthy addiction. And for people who have struggled with substance abuse, it can often be a really great way to supplant that that um, that that high. Yeah. And and and, and it's doing in, in a way that um, you know, that really is just all about taking care of yourself and pushing yourself and beating yesterday and being better than you were th- you know, the, the day before. And um, and that I mean, one of the great things about movement and one of the horrible things about being a professional chef is that as a professional chef, we tend to just move in a couple of patterns. Yeah. And so you're repetitive. Yeah, it's repetitive and you're usually doing the same sort of thing. And it's funny how most people think it's like, oh, you're chopping with your knife and you're just <laughs> doing that. It's actually more like, no, you're bending over t- in like an inconvenient little <laughs> space in the kitchen to grab a, 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 a rondeau that's full of, um, you know, lamb shanks and then pull it out and you're bent over you're not actually engaging your body the way you should to mechanically lift that weight mm-hmm. and you're you're stressing yourself and you're doing that over and over and over again and so you start to get stuck in these patterns that are really um they're 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 not healthy patterns of movement so getting out of that pattern um and moving whether it's getting on a spin bike or it's going to a yoga class uh or 
doing CrossFit or whatever it might be, like you're starting to move your body in all so sorts of different movement patterns, um, which means that when you go back into the kitchen and you fall back into those same movement patterns, you might address them differently and, and be less likely to injure your body. So it's really, I mean, it just... The, the more that you move, the, the great thing about the human body, it's kind of use it or lose it. The more you, mm -hmm. the more you use it, it's good at doing whatever you ask it to do. And if you're asking it just to, to, to sit around on the couch and eat potato chips, it gets really good at sitting around on the couch and eating <laughs> potato chips. But if you ask your body to jump up onto a 36 inch box over and over again, you'll be amazed that eventually you'll be able to do it. Yeah. And you'll, and, and, and when you can do it, the, 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 um, proprioception, the, the, the knowledge of where you are in time and space, your body is in time and space, will carry over to everything else that you do, um, to how you sit in a chair, to how you uh, to speak, how you speak to your colleagues, how you carry yourself, even your your physicality. And there's amazing, like I I've seen this happen with so many people who have been who've gone through transformations from when they were maybe they were overweight or they're dealing with addiction or they were they they were ill and the body language is this sort of like hunched over kyphotic state of shoulders rounded forward and kind of the classic like looking at your phone and being very mm -hmm. you know protective of yourself and then as they start to open up and learn how to be in their bodies and move their bodies it's almost like this unraveling um this metamorphosis of the wings kind of coming open yeah. and suddenly they're a much brighter and more open person and something changes hormonally in your body too when you when you open up your body and you you it's almost like you're allowing yourself the the ability to receive love versus like shunning it out. Yeah. And and I think movement um, is really important in doing that. Moving, our, I mean, we we evolved to move, and we've forgotten how to move as nature intended us to move. So getting back to that is so important. And and I didn't mean to sort of discount people further along. I was saying people in their twenties, while well, we can still catch it. Yeah. You and I are right around the same yeah. age, uh, I, I think. And I see a lot of chefs who are our age all of a sudden getting to a point where they're realizing like I can't keep going on no. doing the things they are and they yeah. they're seeing better behavior modeled uh for themselves and I've seen great transformations I've seen you I've seen um Matt Jennings yeah he's who, amazing yeah yeah who, who's really gone through tremendous transformation and really channeled that into cycling and, and doing a lot of physical stuff and I see it's funny I go to these food festivals and you used to see <laughs> more of the chefs like out late drinking and yeah. stuff now they're like I got a yoga class at yeah, 6 a.m. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, something that I really press for at more and more food festivals um, and that, you know, I've seen put into action at places mm -hmm. is like having a sober space. Mm -hmm. And more and more uh, places are, are uh, doing that. They're doing like the early morning, um, you know, AA meetings. Mm -hmm. They're doing yoga classes. They're they're doing all this healthier stuff that is, is the perception has changed. Um, so so much, and it, you're, you're you're right that it is. Yeah, and it's ha it's had to change because it's just not sustainable. The way, you know, the the way that guys like Matt and I came up in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I mean, Matt changed because he was going to die if he didn't change. Yeah, and I changed because I was going to die if I didn't change. Yeah, and um, the, and Marco like, Canora, and Marco yeah. and George, and yeah. all, you know, so many people that were just that that it's very easy to fall into patterns that are destructive behavior patterns in our industry because we didn't have role models that we had very few role models in our industry that you burned out or died. Yeah, exa exactly. They burned out or died. Um, and fortunately that's changing. And, and I, I, I hope that the younger generation of cooks is now recognizing the importance of actually caring for themselves. Can they, they can they there's sustainability in, in their career if they care for themselves, because if they don't, there is no sustainability, there is no longevity. And that's what, you know, all of us have kind of figured out that if, if, if we just can't, you know, I'm almost 45 and I can't, there's no way in hell that <laughs> I would be able to continue to burn the candle at both ends yeah. the way I did for, for years. Can we talk also about how there are a bunch of you, and I think uh, you know I, I have in my head a canon of you who have done this particularly, who have turned that flipping the switch into exercise into raising money for hungry kids. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that yeah. kind of work? Yeah. So I, I I've been really I've been involved with um, Chef Cycle since the beginning, which is a division of, of No Kid Hungry, and um, we started with a ride from New York to D.C. Uh, five years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's now grown. It was, I think there are maybe 20 of us or 25 of us now. There's like 300, I think we had at last Amazing. count, um, riding 300 miles in, in three days um, to end childhood hunger in America. And I think as chefs, we've always, it, the, the number of times that, that 
we are asked to do a charity event and donate our time and donate our food and we always say yes because we that's part of you know that's what we do and we, we went we, I think everybody who goes in the hospitality business goes into it because they really care about caring for other people true, yeah. um, and providing for other people and so it's a, it's kind of like a it's a no brainer to think that we need to um, whether regardless of what the charity is we can we can donate our skill our what we do. Um, but this idea of actually getting chefs moving on bicycles to feed kids, we all feed people in our, in our pro professional lives, um, but the people who in this country who need nourishing food the most, um, we're not touching them. And they're not coming into our restaurants, and their their families are not coming into our restaurants. And so the the, the notion that we could actually ha have an impact where every dollar that we raise could provide ten meals to a kid is something pretty remarkable. Um, and at the same time, if we could supplant the notion of going out for drinks after work for actually mm -hmm. going on a bike ride as a as a group, um, is a it's 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 a it's a positive win also for our community. Um, so it's been great because it's really fostered positive behavior, um, camaraderie, uh, this notion of team and accountability. People are uh, trained together to be able to do it and at the same time raise a tremendous amount of money that goes to towards solving what Billy Shore calls a, calls a, a fixable problem yeah. in, in the U.S. That's a good um, man right he, there. Uh, he's a very good man, and, the, and, and he and Debbie are incredible, and they've done so so much work, and they've done a great job of, of rallying and being just this incredible positive voice to get chefs moving and to create this, this, um, this I mean, it's just like, a, it's it, as I said, it's a win-win. Uh, we, we spend uh, three days together riding um, 300 miles, it's a it's a monumental task for most people to be able to do. It's an incredible um, uh, like bucket list, uh, you know, like it's like running the marathon yeah. for for someone, and and to be able to do that and afterwards, just just to to have the satisfaction of, of having trained and realizing that your body can do this and getting through it with the support of your 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 friends and colleagues, and at the same time, you are making such a positive contribution is is something that's just amazing. I love that. What would you say if sitting across from you was ten years ago, Seamus? What would you what, what would you want him to know? I I think I would want him to know that there there is a different way to live your life. Um, you know, if I was sitting across from Seamus from twenty years ago, mm -hmm. I'd have a lot of advice for him. Tell him, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would tell him first and foremost, dude, do yoga. Start doing yoga every day. Um, and not that I think that yoga is some panacea for health, but it's it, it's an amazing practice that quiets you down, takes you away from the the craziness, and allows you just to be in your mind and your body in mm -hmm. space. And um, and then the physical practice of yoga really is just as you know you, you're learning about your hip flexors. Well, <laughs> you know the the hip flexors have so much to do with spinal health, and the spine is the center of your body that keeps you upright. And uh, having open hip flexors and having a strong core and strong psoas muscles is so integral to spinal health. And um, I would have told, you know, 25 year old Seamus to really focus on that. <laughs> but if I was sitting across the table from myself 10 years ago, I, I would have I would have told myself to not despair that um, that there's a difference between being sick and being a sick person. Yeah. And that I needed to stop thinking of myself as a sick person, but as somebody who had an illness. Yeah. And as someone living with an illness, it's a solvable problem. It's a it's a task that I could take on versus if I was a sick person, if I was just a sick person, I was going to be a sick person for the rest of my life. You told that two year and a half ago, me, and it sunk in and it really changed my perception of yeah. my own body and how I was dealing yeah. with it. And it, it really I can't tell you enough how much of an impact that you've made. And your words also, and your book, I've shared with a niece of mine who is going through uh, a thyroid thing and uh, sending her your book has changed how she approaches food and her body. And I want to thank you for that. Oh, well, I'm so glad. You know, the thing yeah. is, is that I don't, you know, I don't have all the Tear answers. <laughs> no, well, you know, that's, aw. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I'm going to start crying too. I, I don't, you know, I don't have all the answers and what works for me is not like some, it's not like some like golden rule, but I think the greatest thing that I can offer oftentimes is, is, 
empathy yeah. and hopefully a sense of inspiration that if this this fucking asshole can do it then, <laughs> then so can I you know yeah. so and I and I think that's really really important because when I when I um was at my darkest yeah. I really what helped me get out of that was seeing other people mm-hmm. who um who had done remarkable things and overcome remarkable o- obstacles and uh and so now hopefully I can be that person to other people. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I would, you know, I'm very, I'm truly indebted to the people that, um, that helped me, but then some, some of the people that helped me don't even know that they helped me. Yeah. They have no idea. (laughs) Um, and, and just learning their stories, um, was so hugely, hugely beneficial to me because it made me realize, uh, that, okay, there is another way of, of living, living my life. Yeah. And here I'm giving you a chance to be selfish. <laughs> what do you want from the universe? What is the thing that you want that you can say that you, you can let yourself, it's hard to let yourself say the thing you want sometimes if there's something that you feel comfortable or slightly uncomfortable mm-hmm. asking the universe for, what is it? Uh, to help me learn how to quiet my mind. I have a, I have, um, I definitely suffer from anxiety and (laughs) yeah. And, um, you know, for all of the things that I do really well for taking care of myself when it comes to food and movement, um, I kind of have that figured out. I know I got that dialed and I know how to take care of myself. I sleep like shit. <laughs> Same. <laughs> you know, well, actually, I, I'm getting better. Good, good. I, and I, I, I mean, I would like to say that I am too, but I'm not. Um, so I, I think that I, I would, I would, I guess I'm gonna ask the universe to help me get better at sleeping and help me to, uh, to process anxiety in a way that's that is healthier than the way that I do it now because it's definitely hard. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give a little back to you right here then mm. for everything you gave me. I said I was bad at sleeping. I've gotten a lot better at it, the things um, that I do. I got a thing called a sleep uh, a sleep machine, mm-hmm. and it is a white noise machine that is not like a regular one. It adapts to the sounds around you. Okay. So it masks, like, I don't know, like at my, I live on a pretty busy street with mm-hmm. buses and things. It rises to mask that uh, whatever is going oh, wow. on. And even if something, oh my <laughs> Sorry, Douglas, but you snore sometimes. <laughs> I, I know I do too. <laughs> um, but it rises to meet that too. So there's a mask there and it is it game changer for me. Wow. Absolute game changer. And I know that sounds like such a small thing, but I bought little ones for the road too. Oh, no way. You, so there, there's portable ones. Yeah, tiny little. Um, and there is uh, the, the company that makes them. It's called like Sound Plus Sleep or something like that. But it's okay. a really, really great thing. It also works as a Bluetooth speaker. Um, between that and there's a podcast called Sleep With Me. Okay. And he tells you boring bedtime stories in a <laughs> droning voice that seriously, uh. you the first couple of times you think like, what the hell's going on? And then it changes everything. Wow. Yeah. With that, with some L-theanine uh. <laughs> as well, um, L-theanine, melatonin and stuff. So Yeah. I pretty consistently take magnesium, L-theanine, and melatonin yeah. at night. And the, the problem I have is I fall asleep relatively well yeah but then i wake up at 4 30 in the morning every morning yeah the weighted blanket also i started doing oh, yeah. so i don't toss and turn that way mm-hmm. and it has changed my sleep so significantly and like i want to give you a weighted blanket yeah <laughs> um but with the anxiety too because it acts as acupressure right so it really really helps with that but the brain my uh, my therapist old therapist told me because I have a rabid brain, uh-huh. <laughs> and so I would wake up anxious, and I still do sometimes. Yeah. But saying like, you can't actually solve that problem in, in the middle of the night. No, it's true. <laughs> My brother always always says that, and he's right. And you can't. I mean, there's the, no amount of worry. What, <laughs> someone recently said this to me that worrying never solved a problem. Yeah, yeah. No, that's absolutely true. Like you can't die from a panic attack. Yeah, <laughs> which was really important for me to hear. And the worrying doesn't solve the problem. Um, I call it borrowing trouble. Like uh-huh. that doesn't actually, the amount of worrying work doesn't solve the thing. Right. But I want this for you. I want the better sleep. I want this, the good stuff for all of us. And yeah. I have um, five questions that okay. I ask everybody. Yep. <laughs> so, um, and they're easy. Okay, good. But one throws people. Okay. And so, what's your go-to comfort food? Uh, you know, this is going to be weird for you to hear, but I love Podsu. 
I just there's something so about good. I love wide slippery noodles. No, there's it's I can't that's the thing I can't eat right now and I, I miss know. it. And, oh, it's so and do you have a place you like to get it? Did you make it? Um no, I mean there's like lots of places that there's a new place, a new Thai restaurant in the old Pok Pok space that's really good. Oh, I've heard it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um I can't remember what it's called. Croc. Oh, okay, yeah. K R O K, I think is what it's called. Yeah, I have a colleague who lives near it and he's yeah. been swearing by it. Um what is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Whew. It made me emotional. Um, gosh, there's a, there's a few foods that definitely make me emotional. Like anytime I, I have um, morel mushrooms. Oh, uh, yeah. When I was a kid growing up, my, my grandmother and my mom and I would always go hunting for morels. Actually, I would never find them, but my mom knows <laughs> where to find them at all times. So anything with morel mushrooms like immediately makes me think of... of of uh, my mom and my grandmother and, and nostalgic and, and emotional in that, in that sense. Um, uh, I had, um, I went to mountain in, um, in Venice last week. Uh, it was really Wait, Venice, California or yeah, Venice, Venice, Ven <laughs> Venice, California. Uh, it's a Japanese restaurant from the, the Jolino folks. It was really, really good. Um, and the food was, was delicious, but it, um, reminded me of being in Japan mm -hmm. When I was I was in Japan in uh, 2009, filming the next Iron Chef, and um, and I got really really sick. I mean I, mm. I had like a, I had an RA flare up. We were filming the show, and I I had I was having a flare up, and I slipped and fell on the floor, and I couldn't get off the floor, oh. and it was just. And I came back, and had spinal surgery the day after I got back from flying oh from God. Japan. So it was like it definitely. It, I mean I have a real deep love for Japanese food. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, I, I have this, I also remember being in so much pain and being in Japan. So there's, there's that um, emotional element. Yeah. Emotions are again, good, bad. Yeah. <laughs> They're all the same. Yeah. What's the last meal that someone cooked for you in their home? The last meal that someone cooked people for People don't me. cook for chefs. <laughs> I know people are no, scared they, to cook for chefs. <laughs> they do. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Huh. I'm trying to think when the last time I'll cook for you, damn it. <laughs> that'll be the next meal that someone cooks for me. <laughs> um, uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. I have to come back to that. Okay. What living musician, and this is another asking the universe, so this yeah. can happen. What living musician do you want to cook for and what would you cook for them? Oh man. Uh, Chance the Rapper. What would you make for Chance the Rapper? Um, I would do uh let's see what would i make for chance the rapper i'd make paella because i'm pretty good at making paella outside i know you are. <laughs> tell me yeah. about your well, explain your paella please well i would make like proper paella like i would make i'd build a fire outside and mm -hmm. i have a fire ring and i'd put the pan down and um and saute up a ton of vegetables in the pan then pull them out and i would brown some some meat in the pan and then pull it out. So maybe I would do, I might do like a really traditional paella of rabbit and snails mm -hmm. um, with artichokes and uh, and fava beans in the summer um, and a dark chicken stock and a sofrito and I just cook it really slowly. Man. Yeah. I'm that's just what imagining I do. the smell. It always of smells that. so oh good. Yeah. That wood fire. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm just like having this intense mm -hmm. <laughs> sense memory of that. Yeah. Uh, have you remembered what somebody cooked for you? Oh yeah, getting back to that question. <laughs> um, uh, we went to dinner with some friends in in, uh, in Greenpoint a couple weeks ago, and they cooked a ton of food. And it was like it was really really lovely. And um, there was there was like roast chicken, and uh, they made a gluten free pasta dish that was really nice, and roasted vegetables. Um, yeah. It was really nice. That's so lovely. It's always it's always nice when people cook for. I mean, th people are always scared of cooking for chefs, and the reality is that we love it when people cook for us, <laughs> oh, yeah. and we're not critical at all. Yeah, and even if, you know, I like to cook for food critics sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like it's it's fun because I cook the food that I know that I love, yeah. and I just throw it down, and and there we go. So the last question: You've got five minutes for self care. What do you do? Hmm. Five minutes for self care. Uh, take a five minute disco shower oh yeah i really really love a super hot shower products or anything like do you like uh, uh, any smell goods in there or just the hot water <laughs> oh yeah you you know what i i started doing a couple years ago which i love is i i get like little um 
uh, little bottles of tea tree oil and um, and eucalyptus oil, mm-hmm. and I'll get the shower really really hot, and then I'll just kind of shake a few drops into the into the bathtub into the shower, and then you get in it's you've got like this really nice eucalyptusy, tea tree oily, steamy shower. God, that sounds so nice. Yeah. And is there anything that we haven't covered that you're like, damn it, I wish we had talked about? Hmm. Well, let's see. Well, we didn't do a deep dive into food and science, <laughs> we, uh, it, but that might have to be another podcast. I think we c- we can do a whole other podcast yeah. on that too. Yeah. No, I think that like we should we should th- we should definitely do or, a, a, uh, a Shana, podcast. Are you, on the, are you going to be talking doing a podcast about anything well, anywhere? <laughs> yeah, I guess I could tease that a little bit. Yeah. So I'm I'm launching a podcast very soon, um, and you can you'll find out more information about it on on my Instagram. Uh, but yeah, I'm launching a podcast uh, all about um, transformation and metamorphosis. And so we've got a, a bunch of really amazing guests, um, not only in the food world, in in many, many different disciplines who have gone through remarkable changes in life and come out the other side overcoming incredible obstacles. Uh, so we're talking to a bunch of a bunch of people and and uh, that will be coming. It'll be launching in May. Oh, that is fantastic. I think the world can use a lot more of hearing from you on this. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so I'm really excited. I think there's, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be talking with a lot of the people that were hugely inspirational to me as I was mm-hmm. going through my transformation and who I've gotten to know over the years who have also, um, Matt Jennings being one of them, oh. um, who, who's, <laughs> uh, you know, gone through his own journey and has been such, I mean, I, just to give Matt a little plug, because he's, he's such a great guy, has been such a positive uh, voice out there. And I, what I love about him is he doesn't take himself so ser- too seriously, mm-hmm. which I think is really important, because it's it, it's serious shit saving your own life. But, <laughs> but you know, I if you can... Is if your you podcast can, called that? That's yeah, amazing. <laughs> exactly. Um, but if you can come out the other side and have a sense of humor about it, mm-hmm. uh, I think that's really, really important. Yeah, I agree with you. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so yeah, much thanks for, James, having for me. coming. No, I'm so glad to be here. And you can find his books, Hero Food and Real Food Heals, at all of the book places. Yeah, the book places. All of the book places. And you can follow all of his social at uh, Seamus Mullen on all of the platforms. Yep, yep. Yeah. And then SeamusMullen.com. Exactly. That's the easy part about having a name that <laughs> no one else has. I uh, Yes. <laughs> I know that went well. Well, thank you so much. And um, I want to thank our producers, uh, Jennifer Martnick, Alicia Brawl and Amy Frank. Thank you to Douglas Wagner. Yeah, that Douglas Wagner (laughs) for a delightful theme song. And if you like what you heard, please tell a friend, write a review, or rate us. And if there's something you'd like us to talk about or a guest you'd like to hear more from, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip. Find more out about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and on Food and Wine's YouTube page. Thank you for listening and take good care of yourself until next time. Bye.